Mm. Right. So, may I mute everyone and request Reema and, and, and Deepak to unmute themselves. Uh, Mr. Raja, yeah. uh, can you add me as a... As a... Uh, oh, of course, of course. That's something I always do. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's done. Uh, welcome once again to this session of conversations. It's a very special session for us because we have someone whose uh, parents are are Atashians have been with us all along, and I'd like to present the parents as we normally do. This is customary. John and Leela, uh, wherever you are on the screen, please come in. Bharat, can you help? Uh, yes. And, and Spotlight, of course, Deepak also. Okay. Yeah. Now, John and um, I've asked uh, John, uh, Chandy, to please unmute. Yes. And uh, is Leela on the same? Uh, is she in a uh, different? Using this, using the same. Um, okay. Uh, uh, as Mr. Chaddy, uh, please un unmute. And can we spotlight him? Once I find him. Um. They decided not to attend. <laughs> no, no. We will spotlight them. No. Oh. They've got their, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've, they've not they got their videos. They got their videos and their mics off. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I, I don't see the option of spotlighting them. I yeah, I'm not even seeing something has gone wrong. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, find them again. Not that time. We will have to only one. So, what do we do? Uh, have they gone off? Mr. Mr. Chandy has fallen off the screen. Yeah, here she is. Here she is. And now I have to search for John. Yeah, he's, he's on. He's on. There we go. Mm. Mm. They move forward again. That's oh, they're both there. Fine. Uh, just sorry. Mm -hmm. Fine. Uh, I just wanted to present the parents as we normally do. John and Leela and um, Deepak, the son. Right. I would also like to welcome um, the family members of Deepak who are here. Uh, Deepak's father-in-law. Nathan, who was here, and uh, in fact, who came very early, just as I opened the room and uh, went back and has come back, and the others. We also have a few invitees who normally come to our programs from Bombay, Mr. Ramachandran, Bala Subramanian. We have a couple of other names that I uh, uh, haven't quite mentioned. I think there is Bharat from Wapi, there is my own cousin uh, from my family in Kotekil and, and a few others. So welcome to all of you. Uh, today we have got the topic is New York in the grip of COVID. It's not just COVID and it's not just New York because uh, uh, the causes of COVID and the line of treatment uh, are something that 
much has been talked about by so many persons. But today in his talk, um, John told me that he will be going beyond all that. He'll be going to the human dimensions of the, uh, uh, of the crisis, beyond ventilators and beyond the common line of treatment to the human aspect. So it is uh, not just COVID, it's not COVID as we know, or as we have been talking about. And it's not New York alone, because his experiences in a hospital which is very badly affected, his experiences in dealing with patients, patient experience is something which maybe uh, may have happened in the context of a particular setting in New York, but I believe a lot of those experiences have universal significance and universal relevance. So in that context, the talk that he's going to give to us, I think is a, would be a very, very special interest to us. Now, I um, have here with me, Dr. Rima Nadik. Um, can you, Bharat, can you bring in Rima? Rima is known to a large number of physicians because she has been with us. She is the head of the Home Health Care Services of Kite Senior Care. And uh, she's had very rich experience in patient management, management of patient experiences, but diverse fields like strategic planning for hospitals and healthcare management uh, and in counseling and so on. She's someone who has been organizing programs for us in health talks and who, when I approached her, gladly said, yes, I would like to come and attend this. And I have therefore requested her to moderate this uh, discussion. So what we will do is we are now muting everyone. We have muted everyone. Uh, I would hand this over to Rima and Rima will take over, introduce formally Deepak and then start off the discussions. Deepak will do start the discussion, make a presentation, and then later we'll have a discussion. And I would request you, uh, all our members, all those who are here, to write out in the chat box whatever you want to give your queries, uh, your questions, uh, not merely on what he has said about COVID, but on the other areas, um, on, on which he is an acknowledged expert today in, in, in the world. Uh, pulmonology, asthma, sleep disorders, and related disorders. So feel free. This is the opportunity that you should not miss. Feel free to ask questions, write them out of the chat box. And later, if we get time, we will also take those questions on or other questions on which we can put across to him. So over to you, Rima. The floor is yours. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, uh, sir. It is a privilege to be representing Atashreans today. So I'm on the other side of the table. That's very nice <laughs> for a change. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Deepak, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, E-meet, of course. Uh, uh, you know, it's... Um, so I'll, I'll quickly, briefly tell you about what we are doing in Kite Senior Care. So uh, Kite Senior, so I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Group Medical Director for Kite Senior Care. And in our small way, we are trying to bring in a bridge between the hospitals and the homes of a senior. So uh, it's something like the CCRC concept that is available in the US, where um, it's uh, because of space constraints in India, we can't have the CCRC, but there are different pockets that we operate from. So we take care of only seniors uh, in their own homes as well as in our own facilities. So we have a geriatric care facilities, which is like a nursing home, where we take care of post-hospitalization uh, care, transition care, palliative, hospice, et cetera. And we have a different residential centers for taking care of patients with dementia and Alzheimer's. So our teams take care of, you know, they are in residential as well as in their own homes. So would you also introduce? Uh... I will just do that. Yeah. 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 So, and um, uh, just quickly about the kites and us. So right now it's the focus is and the limelight is on Dr. Deepak Chandigarh. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we are very privileged to see that our Indians are doing so well uh, across. Uh, so 
I will request all the Atashreens to join me in welcoming Dr. Deepak Chandi, who is speaking to us today. Uh, and a brief, I can't say brief, it's a kind of an essay that I will read out. He's achieved quite a lot. So saying two lines won't be enough. So Dr. Deepak Chandi is the Joint Chief of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care and Sleep Medicine in uh, Westchester Medical Center in New York. He's also a professor of medicine and neurology at the New York Medical College. Uh, Dr. Chandy finished his uh, medicine undergrad from uh, Calcutta Medical College and went on to do his internal medicine residency in New York uh, and his pulmonary and critical care fellowship in Mount Sinai. Uh, Mount Sinai again has a lot of uh, relevance for me because a lot of my family have been also working there. Uh, he is board certified in various fields, you know, taking internal medicine, pulmonary disease, critical care, sleep medicine, neurocritical care, which is very, very important um, as the age also progresses, which we are seeing now. Um, he has been awarded the outstanding uh, teachers award from the medicine uh, department of medicine every year. That's extremely uh, amazing because students each year become so difficult and so demanding that to get this award from the next younger generations is itself an achievement. Uh, also, he's absolutely intellectual. Uh, so he's been nominated for the Alpha Omega Alpha and he's a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians and he has served as a president of New York State Thoracic Society. He's also a member of Mensa. Amazing, amazing. Um, Biodata doctor, uh, we welcome you uh, and the floor is yours and I will be moderating the session. Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. I, I don't think I deserve that, but thank you. Uh, let me just make sure I can share my screen. So is a part of the, uh, the video is showing up on the screen. Is that correct, Mr. Raja? I think. Yeah. We can see the so screen. I can move that out. Yeah. Let's see if I can minimize that. Are you able to see most of the screen now? Uh, yes, Deepak. But your voice is a bit low, if you don't mind. Just uh, a little bit closer since I'm not on video anymore. Yeah, now it's okay. Now, now we can hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll come as close as I can. Uh, and if you can't hear me, uh, don't don't um, hesitate to speak up. Just let me know because uh, the next thing I can do is I can turn off the fan here. I don't know if that's interfering with the noise as well. Um, so I'd like to start by uh, thanking the residents of uh, Atashri for actually giving me this opportunity and a very special thanks to uh, Mr. Raja who I think has put in a lot of uh, work into organizing this. And uh, so very special thank you to uh, all of you. So as, um, as was mentioned earlier, this is really not a medical talk. There's probably gonna be a couple of slides that may have some medical connections, uh, but this is really more on a personal level. This is really about what it was like to be in the uh, middle of an experience that um, I certainly was not prepared for. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about uh, a few patients. Uh, I think there was uh, a lot of ethical considerations that I think might be of interest to the group. Uh, and I'm also going to talk uh, towards the end about how it was on a very personal level as well. Um, so to set table, I think I'm going to start by um, just kind of giving you a little bit about uh, where I work and uh, the kind of institution that I'm at. Um, so this is um, the physical structure of uh, where I work. This is, as you can see, Western Medical Center. Um, as you can see from the trees that are surrounding um, the hospital and the lack of uh, high rises around, uh, we are a suburban hospital. Uh, about maybe about towards the clouds on the left, uh, maybe about 40 kilometers down that uh, path um, is uh, the, the city of uh, New York. Uh, Empire State will be about maybe 35 to 40 kilometers uh, uh, towards the clouds on the left. Uh, 
Uh, behind the main building is uh, New York Medical College, which shares a campus uh, with us. The main brown building is uh, where I spend most of my time working. That's the main adult hospital. The uh, whimsical building to the left of that is the children's hospital. Uh, and the glass building uh, to the right. Can you, I guess I've been asked if I can see my face. Is this too close? Okay. Yeah, we can we can see it. Yes. Um, so the the glass building on the right is the outpatient facility. Um, so this is uh, the building that I've been working for the last uh, twenty two years. And this is a um, um, a large six hundred and fifty bed uh, hospital, which by U.S. standards is considered to be quite large. It has a, uh, a multitude of intensive care units, uh, as you can see from this list. I spend most of my time in the medical ICU and the neurosciences ICU. Uh, but apart from that, we have a coronary care unit, a cardiothoracic ICU, a surgical ICU. Uh, we are a level one trauma center, so we have a big trauma ICU. We are one of the few burn units um, that are in New York State, so we have a large burn ICU and uh, we have a pediatric ICU as well as a neonatal ICU. So every one of these ICUs eventually, unfortunately, ended up being impacted by COVID. Um, so again, we are a, uh, what we would call in the US as a tertiary or a, or a quaternary care uh, institution. Uh, we are a teaching hospital, which means that we have medical students, MD students, uh, super specialized uh, students like DM students, things like that. Uh, and uh, we pretty much do everything that any major U.S. medical center would do, which uh, includes uh, transplants of every sort. The only transplant we don't do is lungs. Um, and so this is the environment that I am uh, currently working in. And the hats that I typically wear at this uh, institution um, is a variety of different hats, as was uh, mentioned in the introduction. Uh, I'm trained in uh, internal medicine, which in India would be called as general medicine. Uh, but that's a hat that I probably wear very little of. And I spend most of my time doing pulmonary medicine, sleep medicine. And I spend a lot of time in the ICUs, uh, both in the neuro ICU as well as in the medical ICU. But as time has gone on, uh, I think the amount of time that I spend uh, wearing an additional hat uh, has significantly gone up, and that is uh, a hat of an administrator, uh, which is the hat that I was uh, wearing a, a pretty significant portion of the time uh, during COVID. So COVID is a medical disease, and the medical ICU is the ICU that these patients uh, would have been admitted to. And so a typical medical ICU in our hospital would carry about 11 to 14 patients. And these are extremely uh, sick patients. And for a team that is to take care of a patient group like this, we have an enormous number of uh, different types of people. So this is what a typical team that manages patients in the medical ICU would look like. So there would be one attending, such as myself or one of my colleagues, we would have one, what we call a fellow, who is training in pulmonary and critical care under us. Uh, in India, that would be a DM student. We have a multitude of uh, MD students, what they call as MD students in India, who are uh, training at, in internal medicine or general medicine. So we typically have about three third year uh, medicine uh, trainees, and we have four first year uh, uh, medicine residents. Of course, the bedside nurses are probably the most critical part of an intensive care unit. Uh, without the bedside nurses and the high level of skill that they bring to the bedside, uh, none of us will be able to achieve anything in these uh, ICUs. They are probably the most critical part of uh, taking care of patients in the ICU. We have a respiratory therapist, a dietitian, and a clinical pharmacist. So this is a very large team that rounds uh, on a given day, taking care of these 11 to 14 patients. 
And this is where, this is not a picture from my hospital, but this is typically what ICU rounds would look like. Uh, there would be a large group of patients uh, surrounding, a uh, large group of uh, healthcare providers surrounding the patient. Uh, these rounds typically tend to be quite intense. They're very uh, detail oriented to make sure we don't miss any aspect of a patient's uh, uh, medical care that might be relevant to making him or her better. Uh, and so these rounds can be often three to four hours long, taking care of 12, 14 patients. Uh, and certainly at the end of those rounds, we tend to be extremely exhausted uh, and are happy to take a break uh, after a uh, ICU uh, round. So that's the background under which uh, COVID essentially uh, came to us. And so I'm gonna rewind back to uh, the winter of 2020. Uh, and back in January of uh, 2020, we began hearing about these patients in Wuhan who were falling sick with an unknown respiratory illness. Uh, and at that time, it seemed very remote and was certainly not very concerning. But then in February, we began watching these images from uh, Italy, especially the northern part of Italy. Uh, and we could clearly see that a... Um, a fairly advanced medical nation was getting completely overwhelmed. But even then, I think most of us really did not believe, and I have to unfortunately include myself uh, in that list, and I was certainly not somebody who uh, ever anticipated what would hit us. And so most of us really did not believe that the impact would be anywhere near as severe as it turned out to be in the United States. So continuing forward in March of 2020 was the first suspected case of COVID that was admitted to my uh, intensive care unit. And the overreaction and chaos was almost immediate. I can still recall the day that we got that first patient and I pulled my entire team together and said that this was a patient suspected to have COVID and I remember a nurse telling me that she was not willing to take care of that patient because her mother was immunocompromised and she did not want to put herself, uh, put her mother at risk of uh, uh, falling sick. So this was the first few days and the first patient that was admitted uh, had a infection control nurse that was posted outside the room of that patient 24 seven taking down the names of every person who entered that room to make sure that everybody was putting on their PPE equipment properly and that everybody was taking off their PPE equipment properly. So this was for the first patient, but unfortunately and obviously that could not be sustained. And by April, 2020, we were getting multiple ICU admissions every day. And so clearly that degree of um, supervision of people entering these rooms uh, was long abandoned. And quickly our medical ICU was uh, overwhelmed with these patients and we had no more room and our patients were forced into other ICUs uh, at that point. I realized very quickly that my team was about to get completely overwhelmed within just a few more days. But luckily for us, actually three things happened. Three good things happened that I think retrospectively allowed us to uh, survive. So the first was a, a remarkable and probably still mysterious lull in non-COVID hospital admissions during the months of April and into May. So, so this is something that even today we don't fully understand, but typically in a hospital like ours, we get a lot of admissions with the usual cardiac problems. Uh, we get plenty of people with strokes. But amazingly, during these two months, we saw a fraction of such non-COVID-related hospital admissions. 
And so that allowed us and the hospital to focus primarily on these uh, COVID uh, patients. And even to this, and this was not unique to our institution, this was something that was seen in a multitude of hospitals in the United States and is still not fully explained. So the governor of uh, New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, who is our ex-governor at this time, uh, he decided to give indemnity to all healthcare workers getting COVID. What does that mean? Basically, what that meant was that we could not be sued for any care that was related to taking care of a patient. I think there was a recognition in government that healthcare workers were completely overwhelmed and that although we were all trying to do the right thing, that certainly there could be medical errors and other things that could occur. And so by giving healthcare workers complete indemnity, that significantly helped ease the stress levels of healthcare workers who are trying their best to take care of these patients. But probably the most important thing was what the hospital did and which every hospital that was impacted like this did, which is they essentially shut down all elective medical care. So there were no more outpatient visits. There were no more office procedures such as colonoscopies, things like that. And all elective surgeries were completely shut down. So this again, freed up an enormous amount of manpower that became available to us. So there were really two things going on on the ground level in April 2020. So the first thing is that my ICU team would have to manage maybe four, five, six times their normal numbers of patients. And that was obviously not sustainable. But at the same time, we had a large pool of unskilled physicians, and I'll qualify, and I'll say what I mean by unskilled in a second. We had a large pool of unskilled physicians who were really managing only a fraction of their usual numbers of patients. So when I mean unskilled, what I'm really referring to is the fact that they were unskilled in critical care. These were gastroenterologists, endocrinologists, rheumatologists, who really were sitting at home and who had very little patient care that they were responsible for because everything that they normally would do was shut down at that time. So in order to survive, um, the thing that we realized was that we had to think outside the box. And just like in the tic-tac-toe game, the only way you're going to win is by changing the rules on the ground. That was something that we realized that we would have to do uh, in order to survive. So how did we survive? So what we did was we created an army of physicians who were at home, who backed up our team, who were at the bedside. So remember that in the United States, all of medical care is uh, computerized. And so essentially sitting here right now, I can actually enter an order uh, for a patient sitting in my hospital as we speak. So fortunately, this was something that we have uh, the ability to do. And so all these physicians who were sitting at home were able to access the, our COVID patients and help us out in addressing basic nursing concerns. So in other words, if a nurse had something that was relatively simple, the nurse could pick up the phone and call the physician who was sitting at home and that physician could then enter orders. So if, for instance, if there was a fever and the order for prosin or Tylenol, as we would call it in, in the US was needed, then the physician who was sitting at home could enter such an order. That physician would communicate with the physicians on the ground probably about two or three times a day. And those physicians would then basically scribe for us and enter everything that occurred about those patients would be entered in the medical record. So all, all of this allowed the physicians on the ground to actually take care of a very large number of patients because of the backup that they had on a remote level. We had our cardiology fellows or the cardiology DM students who 
worked in shifts. So again, the, the impact on cardiology was significant in that they had very few patients rolling in. And so these trainees were relatively free and they were also very skilled in placing invasive catheters. So we used them to go from every morning, they would go from ICU to ICU where all our patients were um, in, they would actually go around placing catheters. So these are catheters that are what we call a central catheters that are placed in the veins of patients. They are quite complicated to place. And even for skilled providers, it could take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes from start to finish. And most of these patients would require about two of these catheters to be placed. And so, and sometimes even three. And so these, stu these DM students, by doing these procedures on all the our patients, essentially freed up my trainees to actually then manage these patients at the bedside. So what about uh, people like me? How did we survive? So in my division, there are only four of us who actually work in the ICU. So typically we work every fourth week. We work uh, seven days in a row. And uh, so we have four physicians who rotate through the ICU. But clearly now we had an enormous number of patients that we had to take care of. So we knew very quickly that we would need outside help. So fortunately, there were several services that came to our rescue, starting with cardiologists, trauma surgeons, anesthesiologists, pediatric intensivists. They took care of, they were willing to take care of patients up to the age of 30. They broke the rules and they admitted anybody up to the age of 30 into their pediatric intensive care unit. Cardiac surgeons were also willing to help. And so this is the group that came to our rescue by being willing to take care of patients, which by that point had numbered close to 100. So we had at, at the peak of COVID, we had about 100 patients in our hospital uh, on ventilators that needed to be taken care of from a critical care perspective. Now, uh, is an anesthesiologist or a cardiologist as skilled as probably some of us who who do this uh, more from a daily uh, basis perspective? Probably not, but that was the compromise that we had to make in order to uh, survive and uh, move forward. So as the, as the patients started coming towards us and there were days when we would have up to eight to 10 ICU admissions per day, uh, we could see the tidal wave that was quickly going to overwhelm us. And one of my jobs was just to make sure that there was always a plan A and a plan B and a plan C and a plan D that would keep us just in front of the tidal wave that was approaching us. And I think we reached up to about a plan K. And I think that that was probably the last plan that I had left because I had no more resources on the ground. Uh, but at that point, fortunately for us, the wave started receding and we did survive. So what did all of this take? I think uh, if you recall the nurse, who started off by saying that she would not uh, take care of these patients. Um, we, that, that nurse became a very active participant in uh, managing COVID patients. Everyone, there was not one person who I inter interacted with after that. Uh, everyone put aside their personal fears and uncertainties in stepping up and doing the right thing. So, I think that there was in the early days, as probably most of you recall, there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty about this disease. And I know that there still is a lot of uncertainty, uh, but I think that in the early days, it was remarkable that so many healthcare workers came forward and did the right thing. So there was remarkable cooperation and collegiality among the people that I work with. Uh, there was not one person who ever said no when I asked them for help. This was, again, something that I did need to have. The average number of phone calls 
uh, I would get or make on a given day would probably be in the range of 50 to 60. And so I'm glad uh, at that time that I had an unlimited uh, mobile phone plan. So how did we do through all of this? Unfortunately, we are still seeing patients being admitted to our hospital with COVID. Uh, about two months ago, we actually celebrated when we had zero patients with COVID in our hospital. Unfortunately, uh, things are getting bad. New York is not the worst affected uh, part of the United States at this, at this stage. Uh, but over the last 18 months, we have admitted about 2,500 patients uh, to our hospital. About 300 of them ended up in, have ended up in the ICU and almost every one of them was on a ventilator. If you were not on a ventilator, you were probably not getting into the ICU simply because there was a tremendous shortage of ICU beds. We never ran out of ventilators, but we were starting to get to the edges of where we could place these patients. Unfortunately, out of these 300, probably only about 50% of them survived. And it was certainly a very hard time for all healthcare, of course, for the patients and their families, but I think it was very, very hard for all of us because many of these patients died alone. Uh, families were not allowed to visit. The only connection they had was through uh, using tablets that we were using to allow them to communicate with their family members. Unfortunately, in the ICU, most of them were too sick to be able to communicate. And so all that these families were able to do were to see some pictures uh, using a uh, tablet. So uh, this was a terrible, terrible uh, uh, impact on healthcare providers uh, to see families and patients suffer in this fashion. So did we have any options for patients whose lungs were too damaged uh, that even a ventilator was not able to keep them alive? And the answer is yes, we, we do and we did. And that is with using a technology called ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So this is gonna be one of my, uh, probably my only real medical slide and so for the engineers in the uh, audience, this might be of interest, which is how does ECMO work? So essentially the lungs are now too damaged to be able to do the job of pumping in oxygen into our blood and to take carbon dioxide out of our system. So what we have is a, a, a system called ECMO whereby huge catheters, these are enormous catheters that are inserted into patients' veins and blood is taken out from the body. And as you can see to the left, there is this uh, pump and blood is then pumped through this device called an oxygenator where there is a membrane where the blood is separated from a gas chamber and oxygen then through a gradient enters into blood and carbon dioxide in the opposite way goes out from blood uh, into the gas chamber and then the enriched blood is then pumped back into the patient's, uh, in, into the patient's body. While well, that might look very simple, this is what the actual bedside of an ECMO machine uh, uh, would look like. And as you can see, it has an enormous number of pieces of equipment. This is about as intense a level of critical care as you can provide to a patient. A nurse has to be sitting by the bedside 24 seven uh, to make sure that there isn't anything going wrong with any of this uh, equipment. Uh, if anything goes wrong, the patient will die in as little as 10 minutes. So with this being a very expensive and a very resource intensive uh, technology, patients are obviously selected extremely carefully. So unfortunately, there is um, um, some age discrimination here because the patients who are selected are the ones who are most likely to live. Uh, and so younger patients tend to get a preference uh, over patients who are older. Again, we're looking for people who are most likely to survive. And so those with significant underlying medical conditions are often excluded. 
and morbid obesity is also a reason uh, to not take patients with ECMO for technical reasons. So in the last year and a half, we had about 30 patients who were selected for ECMO. And despite all of that, as you can see, only about a third of those patients survived. So we only had about 10 patients who were treated with ECMO who eventually made it out of the hospital. So I'm actually gonna start, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, two uh, fascinating uh, scenarios that we had that I think have significant uh, ethical implications. And uh, for those in the audience, I would encourage you to think about what you would probably do uh, if you were in our shoes. So the first one is a good story. Uh, this is a, a 60 year old marathon runner, obviously, so therefore a very fit person who came into our ICU in March, 2021 with COVID. He quickly decompensated and required to be placed on ECMO. But unfortunately, he did not get better over the next uh, three months or so. And so we began preparing him as well as his family uh, about the fact that he is likely to not get better. But he was a very motivated patient, uh, as was his wife. And so the, 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 that made our job much easier in terms of saying that we will give him a, a, a full aggressive course of physical therapy and, and see if we can make him better. So this was what his lungs looked like. We found an x-ray of him about a month, about a year before he came into us. And three months later, this is what Three months into COVID, this is what his x-ray looked like. So just to take you through uh, what a normal x-ray should look like is what the x-ray on the left should look like. The, the white part in the middle is the heart and the two areas of black on either side are the lungs. Uh, air on an x-ray looks black and that's a good thing because in the x-ray on the left, the lungs are filled with air. On the right, unfortunately, it's all white. And so that means there is very little air that is actually able to enter into this uh, person's lungs. And so this was what his x-rays looked like at about three months. So as you can see, there is very little uh, recovery of his lungs at about three months. This is not obviously a picture of John. Um, this is a, unfortunately, I do not have a picture of uh, a John doing this, but this is really what is required in order to mobilize a patient on ECMO. So this is a huge team of people. There's, as you can see, there's five. We sometimes had six people just to make John walk about 15 to 20 steps. You can see this enormous piece of equipment that is uh, trailing behind this patient. And we would do this every single day, seven days a week. And we told the family and the patient that we would try to do this for about four to six weeks and see if he would get any kind of improvement. And lo and behold, we started seeing changes within probably about two weeks of doing this. And within about maybe four to five weeks of starting this aggressive physical therapy, um, John had improved to such an extent that we were actually able to disconnect him from the ECMO machine. So this is the real picture of, uh, of John. Uh, this was on the day that his uh, ECMO, uh, he was disconnected from the ECMO machine. Uh, it's, this is his wife on the left, um, and these are two of my ICU nurses. And what John wanted to do was, he said, I want to go outside. And this is a picture of John sitting on a patio just outside the hospital. Uh, he is still connected to an enormous amount of equipment that is kind of hidden under the table, uh, but these, the, the, the nurses uh, were willing to do this for him. And uh, so what has happened to John um, uh, to complete the story is that um, John left our hospital about a little over a month ago. Um, he, has, he spent about four weeks in rehab and he got home about uh, two or three days ago. Uh, I just got a message that he has reached home.
So this is a, a slightly different story, and this is the, uh, unfortunately not as uh, feel good a story as the story of Genesis, the story of Isabella. So Isabella was a 39-year-old mother of a 13-year-old boy. She was admitted to our ICU in December 2019 with COVID. Again, like John, she quickly decompensated and required placement on ECMO. And, and after about three or four months, again, she was not getting better. Throughout this whole time, Isabella was wide awake, alert, and completely appropriate in all her interactions with us. We did try a period of physical therapy with Isabella as well, but unfortunately, uh, things did not get better for her. So at that point, we were approaching about four, four and a half months. And so we referred her to a couple of local lung transplant centers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that is the one transplant that we do not do at our hospital. And so we referred her to a couple of the local lung transplant centers. Unfortunately for Isabella, three elements conspired against her. So the first is the fact that she was unfortunately obese. And obesity is a relative contraindication to transplantation simply because post-transplantation, they are less able to get mobilized and recover. Isabella had also unfortunately developed kidney failure during a hospital and she was on dialysis. And so she would have needed not just a lung transplant, but also a kidney transplant. But Probably a very relevant uh, um, factor was the third one, which is that Is Isabella was not a, a person who had legal standing in the United States. She was somebody who was undocumented or in other words, an illegal alien. So therefore she had no medical care or insurance that could be provided to her. And so the amount of care that would be needed post-transplant was not something that could be easily provided. And so for all of these reasons, Isabella was unfortunately turned down for lung transplantation. So just as a, a, a personal and maybe a, a proud moment for uh, India uh, is the fact that some of you may have heard that the first lung transplant that was uh, performed for COVID in the United States was performed at Northwestern Hospital. Uh, by actually an Indian surgeon uh, by the name of Ankil Bharat. Uh, Bharat. Uh, he uh, trained at CMC Velour and uh, has been in the United States. And so he was the first uh, person to perform a lung transplant on a patient with COVID in the United States. So that's just a, a trivia. So going back to uh, Isabella, uh, by around five months now into her ICU stay and connected to ECMO, there was no improvement whatsoever. And so we told her that unfortunately at this stage, we saw no way out for her. And we informed her that she would never leave that ICU room and that she might remain connected to the ECMO machine for a period of time, but that at some point, some complication would occur and that she would uh, die and that there was no prospect of recovering from uh, her current condition. She accepted and understood that, but at that point wished to remain connected to the ECMO machine. So at that point, unfortunately, we had to consider certain ethical choices. And so these were the choices that we were facing. And again, feel free to think about what you would have done under the these uh, circumstances. So we have only nine ECMO machines in our hospital and many of them were being used uh, at that point in time. So we had to consider the fact that if all the machines were in use on a given day and a young patient came to a hospital who could not survive without ECMO, what would we do? Essentially at that point we would have have had two choices. We could either disconnect the ECMO machine from Isabella without her permission and give that patient, give that machine to the new patient. In that case, Isabella would die and the new patient would have a chance at survival. The alternative choice that we had is that we 
not disconnect the ECMO machine from Isabella, in which case the new patient would die and Isabella would continue to live, again, in quotations, because again, she had really no prospect of meaningful survival, but she could continue to live for a few more days, weeks, possibly up to a few more months. So I want, want you to think about, and we can certainly discuss this in the chat at the end, think about what you would do if you were placed in this uh, circumstance. So, so is there really a correct choice? So fortunately for us, there was an opinion piece that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is arguably one of the most influential, uh, if not the most influential uh, journal uh, in medicine. And this was a group of physicians from the United States, Canada, UK, and Brazil, who came together to write this opinion piece. And really what they said was that the concept of first come, first serve should not be used. And I'm going to read the next paragraph because this is really what they wrote. And I don't think I can say this any better, and which is why I, I'm going to read this. Because maximizing benefits is paramount in a pandemic, we believe that removing a patient from a ventilator or an ICU bed to provide it to others in need is justifiable. Undoubtedly, withdrawing ventilators or ICU support from patients who arrived earlier to save those with better prognosis will be extremely psychologically traumatic for clinicians and some clinicians might refuse to do so. However, many guidelines agree that the decision to withdraw a scarce resource to save others is not an act of killing and does not require the patient's consent. We agree with these guidelines that it is the ethical thing to do. Now, I think this was... Uh, something that I'm sure there are many on this audience who will not agree with the statement, but that was the decision that we made uh, that we will, abide, we will abide by these uh, guidelines. Fortunately for us, we did not face this. So what was the other aspect that we had to consider? So with no prospect of meaningful survival for Isabella, where we morally obligated to keep Isabella connected to an ECMO machine in Italy. So the perspective, ECMO is available in India. Uh, I actually looked it up to see how much does it cost. And the cost of ECMO is a startup cost of three lakhs uh, is the startup cost. And then it costs one lakh per day to keep a patient on an ECMO machine. You can imagine if that is the cost in India, how much more that would be in the United States. So this is now, we were approaching probably close to 160, 170 days of keeping Isabella connected to an ECMO machine, and there was zero prospect of meaningful survival. But we felt that this was an impossible question to answer. And so we dodged the bullet, and we essentially chose an easy path and asked our hospital lawyers this question. And not surprisingly, we were told that we could not disconnect Isabella from ECMO against her wishes. So how did this end? Unfortunately, as you can imagine, not well. So about six weeks after all of this, Isabella decided that she was done, and so she said goodbye to her family, to her 13-year-old son, and chose to disconnect herself from ECMO. She died peacefully in probably about 10 minutes of the disconnection, and that was a very difficult day for those of us in the ICU. So I said there are ethical questions, but really, what is the ethical question uh, regarding John? You might have raised an ethical question with regard to John. But remember, John is an extreme outlier. Probably we would need to treat one of, we would probably need to treat about 100 Johns in order to get one patient to survive. 
Again, as I said, ECMO is an incredibly expensive and labor intensive process. And so the amount of money and effort that we would need to spend to save one John is absolutely enormous. And really the question I think that we would need to ask is how much can a society, even a first world society such as uh, the United States, how much can a society afford to spend in order to save one life? So what was it like on a personal level? So I think one of the early things that I found very difficult was the fact that I had no idea if I was doing the right thing for my patient. Just like everybody else at that time, we were giving drugs that retrospectively were clearly either proven to be useless or harmful for our patients. But that is all we knew at that time. And we knew that what we knew at that time was very little. So I think that that was extremely hard for all of us taking care of these patients. And the question I would constantly ask myself is, did a patient who got better or who got worse was that because of what I did or despite what I did? So all of us who are in teaching hospitals, for us teaching is a significant part of our commitment and our mission. And so we were all so overwhelmed from a clinical perspective that we had little or no time to train the trainees who were training under us. Work was physically and mentally exhausting. Uh, most of us, certainly myself, we are used to working 12 days in a row. But if I worked even five days in a row at the end of that, I was just completely exhausted. There was no clear light at the end of the tunnel. I think if we knew that this would all come to an end in two months or three months, that was something that would allow us to continue to function uh, at that high level of intensity, but not being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel certainly made it extremely difficult. And of course, there was very little to look forward to outside of work. So there certainly wasn't a holiday to look forward to or a nice dinner with friends. None of that was something that could reduce the stress that most of us were experiencing at that time. So how did, we, how did most of us, certainly myself, overcome these challenges? I think the most important thing was putting things in perspective, certainly from a personal perspective. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, sayings. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with it, which is that I complained about my shoes till I met someone with no feet. So from a personal level, the level of impact that it had on my life was minuscule compared to the impact that it had on so many other people in different parts of the world from an economic perspective and certainly from a medical perspective, the number of people who lost loved ones or who lost their jobs and their livelihood was enormous. So certainly what I went through is minuscule compared to everything that all these other people went through. I tried to focus on the things that I could control. I could not control the number of patients that were rolling into my ICU, but I could focus on trying to find ways to take care of those patients. I tried my very best to uplift people around me. I would walk to every single one of the ICUs that had my patients. Uh, speak to the nursing staff, to speak to uh, physicians, and make sure that everybody felt fully supported or as best as they could possibly be. I kept saying to myself that this will all pass someday. Unfortunately, this might be another thing that I am probably going to be wrong about. So I'm going to um, end with the with a, a video about a patient uh, who I, my team took care of. She was a, a, a 20, I believe she was about 26 years old, a, a seven month pregnant woman who came into our ICU, ended up uh, initially being placed on ECMO, but in her case, not only did her lungs fail, but 
her kidneys failed as well as in a somewhat unusual circumstance, her heart failed as well. So she could not even be supported by the level of ECMO that we talked about earlier. So she needed an even higher level of ECMO called DA ECMO uh, that uh, required to be placed. So she was connected up to all of these machines, uh, including a continuous 24 seven dialysis machine and in the middle of all of this, she was able to deliver her baby uh, via C-section. And so unfortunately, she did have a few complications of the ECMO. She had clots that went to her legs. She required all her toes eventually to be amputated. But the remarkable thing about this woman, as you will see in the, uh, the video, is that she was the most incredibly cheerful person you could possibly meet uh, under the circumstances. So I'm, I'm gonna play the video. Uh, give me a second while I make the adjustment, but um, um, this is the story of uh, this patient. Thank you. Uh, you were just in the, the video? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Birth while in a coma. Now she's finally strong enough to share her story just in time for Mother's Day. CBS 2's Natalie Dudridge reports. This is the moment Serena Torres got to hold her little girl, Alessandra, for the first time, nearly four months after giving birth. Look at that little face. That's your mama. It was the best day of my life. <laughs> I just started crying. I couldn't stop. Serena contracted COVID-19 in October when she was seven months pregnant. I didn't think it was that serious um, because I was 28 years old. I was young, relatively healthy, worked out every day. Then she started having trouble breathing and was rushed to the emergency room at the Westchester Medical Center. She deteriorated quickly and doctors put her in a medically induced coma and performed a C-section because the baby was also at risk. An incredibly rare event where we end up delivering a baby in a person who's had uh, her lungs, heart, and kidneys uh, completely shut down. Alessandra was born two months premature but healthy. She went home with her father while Serena remained hospitalized in a coma for six weeks. Her toes had to be amputated as a result of her lack of movement. When she finally woke up, she had no idea what happened. I um, actually thought I got bit by a shark. <laughs> yeah, and I thought that um, I was dreaming I was by the beach in my coma, fighting through bubbles, swimming to the top so I can breathe. I didn't even have a memory that, you know, that I had COVID. I woke up and said, what's COVID? <laughs> Serena says the second best day of her life was when she finally got to go home on March 20th. I'm still in a wheelchair and learning to walk, but my dream is to be able to run after this little one. We both fought and made it home together. She says the best day of her life is now every day, and she's especially looking forward to celebrating her first Mother's Day. Natalie Dudridge, CBS 2 News. This is a picture that she sent us. Uh, uh, this is something very special Hello. for us. And, uh, we'll end with this. Uh, sorry, Deepak. Uh, I can't hear Deepak, you. Deepak, can't hear. Sorry, we can't hear you. Something went wrong. Hello, yeah. Uh, Deepak, thank you very much. 
uh, it was really inspiring. The three stories that, in fact, when you were talking first about uh, how you and your team were overwhelmed and how you were uh, uh, battling the crisis, we were thinking of the, as you said, of the personal anxieties and fears and the uncertainties and the personal safety of all the health workers. Now, there is one question here. Were any of the health workers uh, affected? Was there any, I mean? Right. I think we were very lucky in our institution that only, we only lost one physician to COVID. Uh, there were no other, and, and there was one, uh, what we call a physician assistant. So we only lost two healthcare providers uh, throughout this entire pandemic. So. Uh, I think under the circumstances, and in fact, if you look at my team, uh, what is even more unusual, I would say, is that of, of our trainees, which numbered in uh, 11 of us, and there were about eight of us who worked very closely uh, with these patients in my division, out of the 19 of us, only three of us got uh, actually got COVID. So this, the remaining 16 of us, even though we've been into hundreds, if not thousands of uh, rooms of these patients, uh, none of us ended up uh, getting COVID. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Uh, Deepak. It was very really inspiring to hear you. Rima? Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. All right. Great. So it was very nice to uh, hear you out. And uh, Corona now does not, COVID 19 does not seem to be a global disease. But what I, after hearing you, we all of all of us had common uh, solutions to it, you know, whatever you're talking about, uh, you know, resonating with you like this cannot reach us, we can't be affected by it, you know, and and and, and subsequently it, it received into our society and in each house that it does and how did we deal with it. Um, also, absolutely the decrease in the other cases like the cardiac or the neuro strokes or in fact trauma accidents, etc. everything was I, I think the nature was trying to help us to deal with one uh, issue and uh, taking away the others. And of course, the same thing like reducing the uh, elective procedures were all shut down. So, you know, and I also took like 150 calls, 200 calls per day, people calling in panic and what to do, etc. cetera. Uh, ventilators going out of the, uh, uh, you know, out of supply. ECMO getting used. So there was air ambulance, which was airlifting patients from remote part of the country or the B cities to come to A cities had an ECMO on board, helping people to transfer. So yeah, I mean, global disease, global solution. Uh, and definitely I think the Corona has taught us few things, except situation, which keeps up the positivity, of course, uh, learning to live with it. And we have come to the fact that yes, this is going to stay like influenza and probably we'll be able to live along with it. Uh, like any other viral condition in the past. And uh, uh, what also see, I, I saw in the past one year, I think I must have seen like 500 plus patients. And uh, one common thing that uh, taught me was positivity kept them going. There were few patients who were panicky and actually ended up in the hospital. Others with positive attitude in spite of their age and comorbidities. And it's okay, let's see, whatever comes and we will take it. And uh, they were able to uh, uh, get through it. You know, they recovered. In fact, there were so many seniors that uh, I took care of at home, in fact, doing remote monitoring and remote consultations, etc. And they were able to come out of it. And thankfully, we didn't have a single mortality in that uh, in, in our, our patient uh, database. That was very happy. So it's like, and I'm also happy to hear that uh, Indian healthcare industry is there it, at par with the uh, the Western world. You know, you were talking about giving remote orders, having to see the notes at home. Uh, it is so good to hear that we are also there. You know, it's, it's very nice to hear that. It just reiterates that we are all here also at the right at the right path. And this disease definitely tested our resilience. You know, our humans' resilience, physical, mental, emotional, everything was tested, and uh, we did all come out very well. And all the seniors in Atashri and various other places that we take care of so many seniors, is really their, their positive attitude, their, 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 their will to get through 
it was it was very very inspiring uh, throughout. Uh, so great, it was a nice chat and very inspirational to see that how uh, you all got through the tough times. Um, you know how humans can stand up, and we have all come through test of times in various times. Uh, what all the doctors can do and doctors actually don't want to be they don't never claim to be gods but what happened in the last you know, one and a half years what doctors have done is no less than miracles all the health workers i mean not just doctors it is really the miracle and the way the the, the medical industry the health workers starting from the top specialists to the nurses and the unskilled workers have come up which we see in India, even though the people are untrained to some level at the bottom level, but they also came up, came out to, you know, contribute in whatever way they could to patient care. And it was very, very overwhelming and uh, very good to see how human race got together to get over this pandemic. In fact, as you were telling was it ethical choices, I remember last year in the month of May, I was taking care of two elderly at home. They were the uh, in-laws of a professor at Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. And she sent me a document to read. And she was telling that she was doing a study with uh, some, uh, you know, the same thing, the ethical choice uh, last year in May. And we were talking about it. And I told her how, in how times change our decisions. Pandemic, our decisions will be different from other times how we prioritize the age, the, as you say, the chances to live and survive, how it all changes, it was, it was amazing. So, but very good thing, I will, I'll start with one uh, comment, which uh, I'll tell who has shared uh, Padmini ma'am has told this, that your accent is not at all uh, prominent. You sound we, like an Indian local doctor. Can we, can we come in with a couple of questions? which yes. uh, have been asked. You see, there are two questions yes. related to sleep. So if I, when I <coughs> told them that we could have questions on sleep disorders also. There's one question on, you know, they restless, have one question, I see a couple of them is that uh, of, they are uh, having muscle cramps. Yeah, cramps. Yeah. Cramps, a common... They have, uh, yeah, most of the elders... Yeah, because of that, sleep yeah. is disturbed. A lot of us have sleep problems. Uh, if you could generally say something about, you know, sleep problems for the agent and what we can do to. Uh, uh... So, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, people don't often realize or think about is the fact that as you get older, uh, the amount of sleep that you actually need significantly goes down. Uh, and um, so that is something that people tend to kind of uh, forget about. So what is something that you needed uh, at the age of, let's say, 30 or 40, if you needed seven or eight hours of sleep, uh, when you're in your 70s or 80s, you might only need six or sometimes even five hours of sleep. So people often ask me, you know, I'm, I'm suffering from insomnia. But really, the definition of insomnia is that you have to be compromised during the daytime. Insomnia is not based on the amount of time that you actually sleep. It is actually based on if you are suffering ill effects of lack of sleep the next day. In other words, if you are feeling sleepy the next day and you are not sleeping um, uh, many hours during the night, then yes, you do have insomnia. But if you are sleeping for five or five and a half hours and you are fairly alert the next day, then that would not qualify as insomnia. The other thing that people tend to forget is that as you get older, you get what is known as advanced phase disorder. That's really not a disorder. It's something that is seen in the elderly, which is that uh, you tend to fall asleep much earlier in the evening and you tend to wake up much earlier in the day. Teenagers have the exact opposite. Uh, my son, who is a, uh, a teenage, um, a teenage, probably actually no longer a teenager, but while he was in his teenage years, um, he, if you gave him a choice and if he was on vacation at home with us, he would probably go to bed at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning and wake up at, at noon. And that is what is seen typically in teenagers, which is called advanced phase. 
So in the elderly, you get what, I'm sorry, that's called delayed phase. In the elderly, you see the exact opposite, which is a lot of people tend to fall asleep at about eight o'clock or nine o'clock and wake up around three o'clock. So, you know, that's not necessarily something you can actually change very easily. It's something that you may just have to accept. Uh, and then also pay attention to the fact of if you are sleeping during the daytime or if you're taking a nap during the daytime, remember you're probably going to decrease the amount of sleep then you're going to need over a 24 hour period. And so keep that in mind as well, that it's the total amount of sleep over a 24 hour period that you need. And so if you are taking a nap during the daytime, then that is going to eat into the amount of sleep that you will have during the night. Thank you. Uh, couple of other questions. Uh, the graphic about uh, yeah. this one, this, good, this, good. Uh, Vishwanath asked about, is taking a blood thinner a must in spite of this creating stomach acidity? I'm sorry, say it again. What is the question? Is taking blood thinner is important in spite of it causing acidity? Uh, you mean blood thinners is a cause? Blood thinners, like aspirin, necrosprin, cosmetic gastritis. Is it important to have that? So is blood thinners uh, okay to take in the setting of somebody who has acidity? No. It is that why should we eat that? Are blood thinners must in spite of it creating stomach acidity? So not, so again, I guess the definition of blood thinners is, uh, so not all blood thinners cause acidity. Certainly uh, drugs like uh, aspirin and, uh, so aspirin is probably the drug thinner that is being referred to. Uh, so ultimately it depends on what you're taking the aspirin for. Uh, in certain circumstances, it might be absolutely critical uh, for instance, to prevent you from having further heart attacks or to prevent you from having stroke. And in that circumstance, you may have to balance the risk of increased acidity and treating the acidity uh, versus uh, continuing on with the, uh, the blood thinner. But if it is one for primary prevention, which is where you've never had a heart attack or a stroke, and you have significant acidity, then maybe you could make the argument uh, against taking a blood thinner. But again, this is probably a little outside of my area of expertise. Uh, and so I probably shouldn't uh, comment too much, but ultimately as with any drug, uh, I'll, I'll just make a very general statement about any drug. There is not a single drug in this world that does not carry a side effect. And so therefore every drug has to be weighed against risk versus benefit. And that decision has to be made between the doctor who's taking care of you and the patient. And as long as both sides fully understand the risks and the benefits, that is a dual decision that needs to be made between you and the physician. Yeah, and that is why it is recommended that blood thinners to be taken on full stomach. So elders eat well, <laughs> don't skip your meals. Right, we can take one more question, but at the most two. Um, there is one I had question. one question, doctor. I had one question. Now, when the patients are uh, on bed immobile for a long time, of course, we use DVT pumps to prevent the clots. And uh, uh, are uh, CPM machines also be used for the same purpose? Uh, the continuous passive movement machines, which we use for... So we do use them. So I, I think in the early part of COVID, what was interesting was that because of this whole risk of blood clots um, and... Uh, so there was a big move towards actually putting them on significant doses of anticoagulation uh, to prevent blood clots. But now we know from a recent study that that actually is harmful. Uh, another example of things that we did early on that retrospectively has been shown to be uh, harmful. Uh, but the answer to your question is yes, these patients are at very, very high risk of developing blood clots in their legs. And so all of them are not only on doses of heparin or unfractionated or fractionated heparin uh, as a low molecular weight heparin, as well as we put them on what we call as uh, compression devices on the legs, uh, what I assume you're referring right. to. Right, so yes, yeah. We use both uh, simply because the risk is so high in these patients. All right, okay. Okay, one more question. This one? 
what triggers spontaneous pneumothorax? So we saw a lot of that. Um, we saw a lot of that in our patients with uh, COVID. We probably had about twenty-five patients with spontaneous pneumothorax in the. So just to clarify, what is pneumothorax for the for the audience? Pneumothorax is where a part of the lung actually ruptures. Think of it like a balloon that kind of uh, bursts, and so now air escapes out of the lungs and occupies the space between the lung and the chest wall, and that can be an emergency event that needs immediate medical attention. Um, so that is basically something that if the lungs become stiffer, the risk of a pneumothorax or, or, a, or the bubble bursting, so to speak, will go up. And so that's why as time goes on of these patients with COVID, their lungs are getting stiffer and stiffer. And so on a ventilator, what is happening is air is being constantly pushed into these lungs. And if there is any weakness in any part of the, uh, of that, uh, the walls of the lungs, that uh, area will rupture and cause this pneumothorax. So it was unfortunately quite common. And it's something that we had to be very, very aware of and respond to immediately. Thank you. Just uh, the last question. Any uh, follow-up on long-term immunity issues, low immunity issues to the patient's discharge? Uh, so, you know, I think that's a question. Certainly, I don't have the, the knowledge to answer, but I, I, will, I will take a stab at it, which is that, um, um, you know, clearly we know that right now the, uh, the vaccinated patients in the United States are actually falling ill with COVID. Um, so clearly there is some degree of immunity that is being lost. Uh, the example that we are seeing in Israel, Israel is the country that actually has generated the most amount of attention with regard to failing immunity with time. And so, but I think this is a somewhat and still undetermined topic. What we do know about, about immunity is that, uh, at least in the United States, just yesterday, the CDC came out with the fact that um, a vaccinated patient is 11 times less likely to die of COVID than an unvaccinated patient. In our ICU of the 150 patients that we have lost um, since this all began, uh, we have only lost one patient who has been vaccinated. Uh, we currently have about six patients in the ICU. Every one of them is unvaccinated, and that is certainly the experience uh, in the United States. So I think think that we can certainly state without any moment of hesitation in stating that vaccination will save lives or does save lives. Uh, however, when is a booster dose needed? When is a maybe a varied or a different vaccination booster needed? I think those are questions that will need to be answered as time goes on. Um, but I think that each country is but COVID has really been about, to a large extent, about a lot of guesswork, not necessarily because the simple fact that data is not available. And so people are making what are best uh, case decisions based on the information that's available. And the information is certainly incomplete. So I'm sure that different countries will choose different vaccination strategies. Uh, and so you just have to go with what um, you know is available in your country at that point. I just got my booster about ten days ago uh, before coming here, and um, so you, you know I, I think that you are never going to get perfect data as you move forward. I think you just have to accept that data is somewhat flawed, uh, but that is the best that can be done under the current circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, the. Isabella case that you that you presented was really a case in ethics which uh, one must have been one of the most difficult for any person in any field uh, of ethical choice. The dilemma that was presented as I mean it highlights the fact that very often ethical choices the choices between not right and wrong but between one right and another right and depending on the criteria that you use you reach different decisions one criteria by the doctors the other the legal criteria criterion so that is really instructive and not merely that 
the entire presentation was so brilliant that all of us who listened to it uh, took so much from it and i think that this is something which uh, i'll make the recording available to others who would want to uh, listen to this both in our history and outside who could not join us uh, thank you very much indeed the last word of as often uh, in our history programs is that of padmini and i'll just read it out thank you we take great pride in you one one of us as it were bless you you are a special person born to two very special people in our midst so i i, I hope you heard it you got it yeah <laughs> i don't deserve that but thank you <laughs> okay yeah thank you thank, thank you, you very Dr. much and it was really may enriching I, to speak to you and listen to may you may i request uh, bharat to come in and propose a vote of thanks bharat can himself do the spotlighting oh okay <laughs> yeah bharat yeah, i'm sure there's some ethical questions involved there spotlighting <laughs> myself uh, yeah thank you thank you uh, deepak and thank you dr reema that that was really engaging i could i mean i could see from the comments i could see from people's faces uh, they were all glued uh, didn't, didn't want to miss some a, a word of what you said it's a matter of great pride of course uh, deepak uh, i mean is sort of one of our own uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> you may not want that title but you're one of our own and it's a matter of extreme pride to us and uh, the stories you told us uh, i mean this uh, isabella story uh, particularly you said there was not a dry eye in your room i did not have a dry eye at that point that that's just an amazing story um i noticed uh, your ecmo uh, photograph which was not isabella was on march 9th 2018 when the world had not <laughs> heard of covid so i'm sorry to hear that there was need for ecmo even before covid uh, <laughs> yeah but uh, it was just very engaging thank you uh, 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 you uh, we all know doctors are our heroes at all times but particularly at a time like this i mean just I mean, no words can suffice how, how grateful we are to the community and and dr reema I, i want to include you specifically in this uh, it was uh, uh, thank you for uh, supporting the program and, and the, the discussions you had and it, it was very very encouraging to note that uh, indian medical practice is on par uh, at least on par with what's going on in the us so uh, that was very reassuring and and thank you as well for your service to here and and to atashri dr reema Thank you, Deepak. Uh, I'm actually only about 200 meters away from you. I hope to actually see you, meet you soon. <laughs> I met once before. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Rima. <laughs> thank you, sir. Joining us. Thank you, sir. Uh, for the thank you so much. Session. Yes, and I like one comment of Padmini, ma'am. She said, "Hurray, I'm a teenager. I like that." <laughs> <laughs> You're right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Deepak. Yeah, there are many other comments from her. I'm not reading out all of them. Uh, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right.